you take your Bibles and turn over to the Psalms. We're going to be looking at a passage in Psalm number 85. Psalm 85. This short psalm, this song, beautiful and meant to be sung, full of promises of God, from God, and prayer to God. We do a little different than we normally do. Instead of having a, a scripture reading together, I'm going to go ahead and read all 13 verses. You can even remain seated. But today I want to take a look at this request from the heart of one that loves God. A prayer really for mercy for a nation, the nation of Israel. I believe it's something that you and I should be requesting and praying for in our life. Throughout this year, we've talked about the heart, having a heart for God. And it is, uh, during this last quarter of the year, we'd like to talk about the seasons of the heart. One of the seasons we all go through is those seasons of revival, season of rebirth. And that's what we'd like to speak about today. This song, this wonderful song, gives us a prayer for revival. And during this uh, season... I hope that you would join the multitudes that are praying for God to send a revival that would experience uh, some reviving in their own heart and life. Have you ever read about a mighty movement of God? I think uh, last year when I preached uh, uh, before our revival, I spoke about the Welsh revival at the beginning of the 1900s. How thousands of people got right with God because that multitude of thousands of people, some say up to 100,000 people got saved in the, in the country there of Wales during that revival time. Few of us have ever seen anything like that. Wouldn't you like to be the beginning of a mighty movement of God? Man. Wouldn't you like to have that the prayer and say with me, God, Lord, I know you have the strength to do it again. A revival is a renewal, it's a restoration, it's a fresh inflow of life, of love, of the power of God. People faint. People droop just like a flower droops. Right? When placed in fresh water, it gets revived. Christian churches... Christians in their own lives, they droop, they faint, they need uh, reviving, they need refreshing. Sick person may revive a little bit, there's degrees, right? They get a little bit better. That's not what we're after. <laughs> the same could happen where a person could be revived from a sickness, right? And then have complete health again. And this psalm here, the psalm writer is deeply burdened about this. He's deeply burdened about his nation. I don't know how anyone, a U.S. citizen or even just living in this country, could not be burdened for our nation. We'll see all what's going on. Would you look at the scriptures with me? Psalm 85, verse number 1. The chief musician, a psalm for the sons of Korah. Lord, thou hast been favorable unto thy land. Thou hast brought back the captivity of Jacob. Thou hast forgiven the iniquity of thy people. Thou hast covered all their sin, Selah. Thou hast taken away all thy wrath. Thou hast turned thyself from the fierceness of thine anger. Here's the request. Look at it. Turn us, O God. You notice in those first three verses, thou, 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 we're talking about God and what he's done. Now the request is, God, now we want you to do something in our hearts. O God of our salvation, cause thine anger towards us to cease. Wilt thou be angry with us forever? Wilt thou draw out thine anger to all generations? Wilt thou not, and here's the question, revive us again, that thy people may rejoice in thee. I want to stop right there just for one second. You know why sometimes I believe 
And God doesn't send a mighty revival because uh, the result of the heart of someone really longing for revival is not for the results of revival. Not for just a large number of people being saved. Not just for a church is being blessed. That's the results of the revival that God sends. But he says the reason that God would send a revival is when his people, thy people, rejoice and find our true joy not in things or circumstances, not in material blessings or numerical blessings or even financial blessings, but we're looking to his presence and we are rejoicing in the fact of who God is. And that's when God sends revival. Come on. For far too long, we've been too distracted with, with any other thing but being happy and rejoicing in the presence of God. I believe some that even pray for revival. Really what they'd like is the results of revival, not rejoicing in the presence of God. Verse 7, show us thy mercy, O Lord. Grant us thy salvation. We all love, we all love these things. I will, I will hear, right, what the Lord God will speak. He will speak peace. We love peace unto his people, to his saints. Let them not turn again to folly. We love to be directed not into folly. Surely his salvation is nigh them that fear him. That glory may dwell in our land. We love the glory of God. Mercy and truth are met together. Righteousness and peace have kissed each other. Truth shall spring out of the earth and righteousness shall look down from heaven. Yea, the Lord shall give that which is good. And our land shall yield her increase. Righteousness shall go before him. And shall set us in the way of his steps. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the reading of your word this morning. Lord, we thank you. And there was a poet here. There was a psalmist here. You inspired him. You gave him these words. And it was the desire of his heart, Lord, to see your revival, your reviving coming to his nation, to his people, uh, God's people at that place. And dear God, I pray in like manner, Lord, this morning, that we as a people... We we'll have that same spirit of desiring, Lord, for you and for your presence to come among us, that we would have a spiritual revival in our own hearts. And, Lord, for the sake of our families, for the sake of our community, for the sake of our nation, that it would spread, that the, that the results would pour out. Of course, Lord, we want the results, but ultimately, God, we desire it. Beyond these things, we desire for you. Help us, we pray, in these very moments. We seek your face, Lord, help us to come to a place where we would be ready to receive revival. In Christ's name we pray, amen. What does a season of revival look like? How does it happen? I believe we have clues not only here in Psalm 85, but all throughout the scriptures. God tells us, this is uh, what I like to call an open secret. God is not hiding anything, but from many people, they don't know. God wants us to know. God, put it this way, he doesn't give pop quizzes. He doesn't surprise you with anything. There's something that's near and dear to the heart of God. God expresses it, and so he has done all over in his word. Before we would experience a season of revival, I think the very first thing is we need to understand we need to confess, if you will, our great need for revival. Right. Let me ask you this morning, do you see in your own life a, a need for you to be experiencing in a more passionate way, for your love to be growing for the Lord? Uh, do you see that need? Can you look back and say, you know what, compared uh, to how I was, perhaps when I first trusted the Lord as my Savior, compared to how I was uh, when I was first uh, reading the Bible for myself, compared to how I was uh, that, uh, that first time uh, that I spoke to someone about the gospel, and they didn't reject it, they received it. That excitement has, has waned. And you can look back and you can say, dear Lord, I confess to you, I need revival. The psalmist's prayer is really a confession of his great need. It was only when he felt the need for revival, when he knew he needed the Lord, that he cried out to God and said, God, when will you revive us again? Amen. You don't ask for revival. You don't speak those questions unless you recognize that you need it. Right. 
We're here this morning before the Lord God. Let's take an evaluation of our own hearts and say, Dear God, I need a season of reviving tonight. Yes, sir. Sometimes it takes certain circumstances in our life to bring us to a place where we would say, uh, Yes, I need revival. How, how awful it is uh, that uh, something tragic, something bad would have to happen. We'd have to see uh, people killed, gunned down by their own citizens. We have to see uh, just storms come through, sweep through, and destroy people's homes. We have to see these tragedy things, and we finally get to the place where we, we say, Lord, I, I do need revival. Mm. Let me ask you this. Uh, when, the, when the tragedy struck uh, there in Las Vegas, how many Christians do you think were there in Las Vegas doing things they should not have been doing? Okay? And they heard of the tragedy, they heard what was going on. You know what? They weren't even in a place to be able to call upon God. They've been ignoring God. Now they would come to him humbly and say, Lord, could you, could you help these people? Lord, would you, would you keep me safe? Let me ask you, don't forget. Forget about those that are there. Let me ask you, what place were you in spiritually? When you heard about, about the tragedies that are going on in our nation, what, what place were you in spiritually? A place where you say, I'm close to the Lord, and I, I've been calling upon Him, and, and I know I can, I can speak to Him now, and I can ask for His help. He's heard, He's answered prayer. How, how close is your relationship to the Lord this morning? And if it is waning, and if it's cooling, if your heart has grown cold, we need a season of revival. Would it be that we would ask for revival in our own hearts, just as the writer of the Psalms did? I want you to think with me in the outside world, right? Those that don't know the Lord. Those that are without God, without hope in this world. That's what Ephesians says. Without God and without hope. Most of them are outside of churches. And revival, real revival amongst God's people is the only, it's the only hope. The only key that they would have to unlock the door of the tragic situation they find themselves in without God. See, it is God that has chosen for those that know the Lord to share the good news of the gospel with those that don't know the Lord. And if you are here this morning and you know the Lord is your Savior, uh, God has desired not only to save you, but he has given you a great commissioning. He has given you a great deputation, if you will, right? He has deputized you, and he has given you all the license that you need in his great command. Why? He said, all power is given unto me. Do you understand? He's got the authority uh, to give you this command. Sir. And he says, as this authority has been given unto me, I give it to you, and I send you that as you're going, that you would teach all nations. There is no one, no country, no heritage that anyone has, no place they could come from. We would say, hey, you can't get saved. But the Lord will receive anyone who would call upon him in faith and repentance. Amen. And God has chosen in this world to use us. Let me ask you, Christian, this morning, do you need revival? We need revival because there, there is, yes, there is an outside world that needs a Christian church, that needs a Christian witness, that needs uh, someone who's on fire for the Lord, who could call out to God, who could share the gospel with them. Uh, this is our great responsibility, our great burden. God has said, if you know me, if you love me, stay close to me uh, so that others would see. Pastor Phelan preached the other night, right? He see you praising and, and praying in the midst of the prison. And you see you turning to him uh, when your times in your life become overwhelming. Now this is the great witness that God has given us to go through this world and be a witness for him. Really? You understand? Not everyone's going to trust the Lord. Not everyone's going to receive him as Savior. I believe these last few nights we've had some lost people in the services. And you know what? They left lost. And it grieves my heart. Amen. But you know what? Someday they're going to stand before God. And someday when they stand before God, uh, they cannot say... They cannot say that they did not hear. Yes, sir. Now, God will be justified in, in, in dealing out uh, their judgment. Why? Because he says, no, you, you went to that revival service, and, and there were folks there uh, that loved me, and they, they shared my love with you, and, and you rejected it. Yes, sir. But how awful is it going to be on Judgment Day for you and I when we stand before the Lord and He says, you know what, there were lost people in this service, there were lost people in your community, there were lost people in your family, and you never had a passion for God. You were never revived. You never realized you had a, a need for me like you should have. And, and they went right on by. 
If you'd have loved me, if God had made a difference in your life, if your, if your love for me was, was contagious and you, you enjoyed my presence, you rejoiced in me, that would have been something they'd have recognized. Remember the title of the message Friday night? The prisoners heard. What prisoners are there in your life? Trapped and bound by sin? And what is it that they're hearing? You hear from the world nothing but confusion and chaos and tragedy. We have a great need for revival because there's a lost world that needs, right? Uh, that needs a Christian to be so in love with God. His presence would be evident in their life. Preach it. Not only is there a need in, in our outside world, there's a need in our churches. Many churches today are worldly. You know, on one side. The other side, they're formal. Dry and dead. I don't know what's worse. They're lacking in spiritual power and real life and real vitality. And only, only a revival, only a revival of God's people can change that. Let me tell you, what, what, what would happen? I am not so arrogant to believe that God only works in Bible Baptist Church. You understand that? But let me tell you, what would happen if, what would happen if we became revived? You know what happened? I believe other churches would, would, would say, you know what? I wish, I wish we had something going on in our church like, like they have going over there Bible. It would be a great witness to other churches, to other Christians. Yes, sir. With, with the tools that God has given us today, you understand? A revival can, can spread even faster than it ever has. Amen. God's really opened something up for us. We don't even need them. You understand, Spurgeon's day and Moody's day, they were relying upon the people in the, in the, in the media, the press, to take shorthand of the sermons and to write about uh, who got saved and who did that and what the sermon was about. And praise the Lord, they did. You know, we don't need the media anymore. Do you realize? We don't need the media. Right now, where, where's the count? Right now, okay, uh, these services are broadcast internationally. Amen. God has given his people the tools we need uh, to be a great influence. And who's going to watch? Well, I don't know who's going to watch it. Maybe someone, we, we, we have the map of it, right? There's people on every continent that watch our services. Isn't that crazy? What will God use to spur on this church, to spur on other churches? I don't, I don't know what else is going on in the world. Maybe, maybe someone in some dark country. I don't know what else is going on. But you know what? There's a church in New Jersey. And they seem to be excited about what God... They seem to really love the Lord. Uh, they, they seem to love each other when they gather together. They seem to love singing to God. They, they love reading His Word, studying it, talking about it. You know what? They even love each other. They have a stupid ladies fellowship with oil, right? Why? Because they just love being together. Have to be careful there? Yeah. You can picture in your mind like a target. The outer ring is the world of good influence, the inner ring of the other Christians that do know the Lord, and the very center of that target, the bullseye, is your heart and mind. You know why we really need revival? Because you and I are incapable, are incapable of living a life that's pleasing to God. We're incapable of really fulfilling our purpose without a revival of our spirit, a revival of our souls, a revival of our love for God, a, a renewal in our passion for Him. Listen, man, you're incapable. You're unable, I'll tell you, I, I, it, to be the father and the husband, the son, right? You're, it, it's impossible. And it, when you think that you can do those things in your own strength without having a passion for God, you know, I can just get by and what I, how I got by before, I'll just go on that way. Uh, that's the worst situation. We don't see our great need for revival. Ladies and gentlemen, you need revival to be the mother, the father, the husband, the wife. You need revival just to be the church member uh, that God wants you to be. You need revival if you're ever going to live a life that is pleasing to God. Why? Because without faith, it's impossible to please Him. And that renewal of trusting in God, of expecting from God, of going forward with God. Only God can do that. Amen. And there will never be any revival until we're first willing to admit our desperate need for revival. Yes, sir. What does a season of revival look like? It looks like a people who have hearts that they know they need revival. What does a season of revival look like? You have to admit that a season of revival is, is possible. Do you understand? 
Is this season of revival possible? Are you convinced that revival is possible in your heart, in your life, in your family, in this church? Are you convinced that revival is possible in our community, in this nation? Are you convinced that it's possible? Look at, look at Psalm 85 again with me. Six times in the first three verses, he said, Lord, thou hast been faithful, right? Thou hast brought back, thou hast forgiven, thou hast covered, right? Thou hast taken, thou hast turned away. What, what is he talking about? He's talking about God and what God is doing. The reason he reminds us of this thing, the reason he reminds it himself here in this fact that God has sent revival in the past and that revival flows from God. And you know what? Uh, we think our, we always think we're like the exception. Well, God, you don't really know how bad things are here in 2017. You don't really know the turmoil going on. Let me tell you, uh, things have been way worse in the hearts of men before. And God has sent his spirit of revival to his people, to his churches, and he's done so in a great way. Uh, the darkness, you understand, never inhibits the light. Oh, it's just too dark. You know what you need? Just a little candle, and it shines very bright in the midst of darkness. Sir. The darker things are, I believe, the greater opportunity we have to show a contrast of what it means to really know the Lord, what it means to really love the Lord. He says, I got to look back, and you've done this, and you've done that, and nothing has inhibited you. Do you believe today with me that revival is possible for your heart, your life, this church right now? Do you believe it? Amen. I think we don't. I think I don't. I think, Lord, <laughs> I believe, as the story said, right? Help thou mine unbelief. The possibility of a coming revival in our day. Look, we're all pessimistic about it. We're all unbelieving about it. We're all self-satisfied. We all have in our heart a, a root of love, right, uh, for the world that we know should not have. And the only way for God to root that out is for you to realize, look, it's possible for God to do that. Do you understand? It's possible for you to live a life in faith, that's pleasing to God. It's, it's possible for your Christian life to be one that God receives you in glory and says, well done, I've been a faithful servant. Faithful to love me. Faithful to serve me. Faithful to stay consistent. Faithful uh, that even when you felt waning, though you return to me. I love the, the great revival passages in Scripture. I don't know if you, if you haven't highlighted, but perhaps you should. 2 Chronicles 7, 14, you know what I'm talking about? He says, if my people, which are called by my name, humble themselves and pray. Look, what, what are his people doing? God's people are turning to him. Why? The, the condition for revival is for God's people getting right with him. It's not for the world to be good and ready. It's not for the world to, uh, to have a moral high standard. No, he says, if my people, and God promised his people there in 2 Chronicles, that he would send revival in a special, miraculous way, if they would get right with him. Preach it. Jeremiah 33, 3, call unto me, and I will answer thee. Now, there's no other stipulation for getting an answer from God than for God's people to ask and to call upon him in humility, right? Turning from our sin. We call to God, he answers. Amen. It's not based on any other circumstances. Malachi said, prove me. God says, prove me. And who, it is, who is it that we're proving here? See, we get our eyes focused on so many things, from our circumstances to our own abilities. And God says, you need to be looking to me. You need to be calling upon me. God says, uh, you need to humble yourself before me. Uh, God says, I'm the one who wants to put my glory on display. I'm the one who will work in a way that everyone will recognize it's supernatural. God says, look to me, call on me. These are the promises of God. They prove to us, yes, uh, that revival is not only needed, but revival is possible. A season of revival in your heart and mind is possible. Why? Because God promises that it is. Amen. Leads me to the next point. Uh, what is the source of a season of revival? How does it come? Uh, who do we look to? Look back with me in Psalm 62. Just a few pages in my Bible back, Psalm 62.
Verse number five, Psalm 62, verse five says, My soul, wait thou only upon God. For my expectation is from him. He only is my rock and my salvation. He is my defense. And I shall not be moved. Why? Because I'm trusting in God. In God is my salvation and my glory. Uh, the rock of my strength and my refuge uh, is in God. I uh, trust in Him at all times, ye people. Pour out your heart before Him. God is a refuge for us. Surely, he says, men of low degree are, are vanity. That, that's you and me. Why don't we realize they're not we're men of low degree? Right. Men of high degree are a lie. Don't trust in them either. Just because someone's got more talent, more ability, they're a little polished up. To be laid in the balance, are they altogether lighter than vanity? That means lighter than nothing. Lighter than the breath. Trust not in oppression. Become not vain in robbery. You can't even steal. Forget about socialism, calm. You can't even steal your way into it. If riches increase, set not your heart upon them. Understand, the real source of it is where we have our heart. Look at verse 11. God has spoken once, uh, twice have I heard this, that power belongeth unto God. If we're ever going to have revival, if you're ever going to have a season of revival in your heart, you're going to have to turn your heart from trusting in your own strength, men of low degree, men of high degree. You have to turn your heart from trusting even in your own wealth, your own financial resources. No, the only source is God. He goes on and on about his, our soul waiting on him, expecting it. Why? From him speaking to the Lord, this means that the source of revival is God. If we are going to have a season of revival, we must only look to him. When we look to man, you know what we get? We get what man can do, what man can accomplish. When we look to money, you know what we get? We, look what, we see what money can do, what money can accomplish. We look to organization, and man, we can get things real organized, but you know what? There's only so much that organization can do. When we look to denominations, right, or even right beliefs, or we look to even on uh, uh, us ourselves, we say, well, we're right about this. We have the right belief about this. Look. When we look to God, you know what we get? We get everything else that we need. Uh, we get the right beliefs. When we look to God, we get all the truth of his word. When we look to God, we get all the strength that his spirit supplies. When we look to God, God says, when you're full of my spirit, that's when you have the boldness to speak as you should. When we see God high and holding and lifted up, that's when we surrender as we should. When our hearts are stayed on him, that's when we rejoice as we should. All of the season, all the results of the season of revival are all based on looking to the great source. The source is God himself. I preached on Friday to the young people in the co-op, right? Can anyone tell me? Everything begins with God. He is the source of any revival that we would have, and we must turn our eyes towards him. May I encourage you here, even in the midst of these services, don't, don't even wait for the invitation. The Lord's speaking to your heart. And look. Turn your heart towards Him now. Seek Him now. Ask of Him now. And in the quiet confines of your heart, you understand, uh, that's what a church service is about. Meditating on God's Word as we turn to it, as we look at it. I'm, I'm speaking here to try to challenge you to think on things, to think on the Lord God. We've come together because we know what the true source is. We're not looking for it. He is the truth and we look to Him. Next, we're going to have a season of revival. There is only one way this season comes. There's only uh, one method, if you will, to employ. There is only one secret in revival. There is something that always precedes revival. Do you know what it is? It is prayer. Passionate, believing, urgent, fervent prayer. If you've studied history at all, and some of you have, have you ever seen a revival start without a season of prayer? It never happens. Because if we are seeking God, if He's the source, how do we do that? We do it on our knees. We do it as we seek Him in prayer. We do it as we beg of Him and we ask of Him something that only He can do. You see, if we really believe that He is the source, 
and we must pray to him. Right back to the beginning there, the beginning chapters of the book of Acts. Where did Pentecost begin? It began in the upper room with Christians on their knees praying for their lives. It wasn't a quick thing. It was a, it was a belabored thing. It had been 50 days, right? Jerusalem was filling with people from all over the world. Uh, the Jews whom they knew had killed their Christ. Uh, the Jews who, who had the political power. Uh, they were in positions of authority. Uh, they, they could have killed them all. They sat there in the upper room and they prayed for the filling of the Spirit of God. And they, Peter walked out uh, that morning, right? Early, it was in the morning, too, too early for them to be drunk. He walked out and began to preach. And you know what? Everyone understood him. The great problem with... Uh, people saying they're trying to reproduce a Pentecost, right? Let's have a Pentecostal move. The great problem is no one understands what they're saying. Everyone understood what Peter was saying that day. Peter knew what he was saying, and everyone understood what he was saying. There was no question. He was communicating the gospel. He was saying Jesus was the Messiah. And to those people there that day, he was the Messiah, and you missed it. You killed him. Right. Men and brethren, what are we to do, right? What an invitation. Any, any way for, for Peter to start asking them questions. What an invitation. Peter gave the gospel and they asked him, what can we do? What should we do? This is the truth. And where should we begin our revival? We should begin it in the prayer closet. This is why we have seasons of prayer and fasting. This is why we began even these services on Thursday with 12 hours of prayer. This is why uh, we, we come together in this way. Look, look, prayer is not just some filler in between our service times. And we don't start on Sunday night with a time of prayer uh, just because we've got nothing better to do. No, this is the beginning of any time of great revival in our own heart is personal prayer. If we want revival in this church, it's corporate prayer. Yes, we seek God, we speak to Him, we ask of Him. Raven revival began with prayer. In 1859, the revival began with prayer. The Welsh revival began with prayer. Every movement from the Haystack revival in New York City uh, to the Layman's revival. You know how it began? Some guy said, I'm going to have a revival. There was an empty church building near where he worked, and they were about to close it down. He said, you know what? I'm going to have a time of prayer in the building. They're, I don't want to close it down. I'm just going to start praying. First 15 minutes, nobody came. He was all by himself. Then three people came. The next day, there was like 20 people. The next day, there was like 100 people. And that lunch hour became something where all the businessmen in New York City would come and they would pray and they knew they needed prayer. I mentioned last Wednesday night, I began hearing there are prayer meetings on Capitol Hill. What to God? What to God? And we begin with season of prayer in our own hearts and lives. How does revival happen? It begins when you seek God in prayer. Amen. Season of revival requires the proper channels. Who are the channels? If I believe that God is desiring to revive His work, right? I believe that God is not willing that any should perish. I believe that God would love to work and move in us. What is the desire of God? God will move in your heart and your life. Revival is the outflow of the Spirit of God through the regenerated Spirit of man. I love what Jesus said in John chapter 7. If you, if you don't have it marked there, I want you to turn there with me. John chapter 7. It's the end of the passage. In the last day, verse 37, John 7, 37, the last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried, saying, If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. He that believeth on me, as the scripture hath said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. But this spake he of the Spirit, which they that believe on him should receive. For the Holy Ghost was not yet given, but because that Jesus was not yet glorified. Let me ask you today, God's given us his spirit. And he said, I'm willing to give the drink. Do you understand? 
His eyes, eyes sit ready. Uh, the, the waters are flowing. He's prophesied uh, that, that he would give us all that we need. And he's saying, but I need someone to recognize their need, someone to seek me in prayer, someone to say, Lord, I'm thirsty for you. Amen. Where are those that would come to God and say, oh, God, I'm thirsty? Here's what we think. We think that revival came to be some kind of like supernatural thing that, that we wouldn't even be able to go up against. Or, no, I, I, I don't believe that. I believe there's obstacles to revival. I believe the obstacle of revival is God's people not walking with Him, not being right with Him. Amos 3.3 3 says, How can two walk together except they be agreed? We want our own way, and we are, in many cases, not desiring to be right with God. Preach it. The greatest barrier to revival is sin. Sin in the lives of God's people. If God's at work making you and I holy, if God's at work getting us to walk with Him, there will be things that we would set aside and say, you know what? I don't believe God has me to do that. There will be things that we would intentionally do. we say, you know what? If I'm going to be right with God, I'm going to be doing these things. A revival in some cases, just, just of, of God's people gathering together, of God's people encouraging one another, of God's people working together to see the gospel go out. You know how Jesus sent people out? He sent them out two by two. You know what that means? You need a partner. A prayer partner. Christian, is there sin in your life? Are you right with God? Are you living in obedience or disobedience? Let me just ask you this. Is there something you know God would have you to do, but instead of doing it, you're saying no to Him? I know there's stuff you want me to do, Pastor. Because no, forget about me. I'm talking. What does God want you to do? Are you being obedient to Him? Many years ago, D.L. Moody heard the preacher Henry Varley say, "The world has yet to see what God would do with one man who is fully surrendered to Him." D.L. Moody said, "By God's grace, I will be that man." I don't know if he ever was. I don't know if he ever was fully surrendered, but I know this. He was surrendered enough to God. Uh, God used him not just to see a revival happen in this continent, but also in the European continent. I don't know if every soul that they counted was right, but according to the count, a million people received Christ under the ministry of D.L. Moody. Churches were revived. Entire towns, you understand? In the entire town, there was no bars anymore because they had no business. Shut them down. Could you imagine the liquor store closed over here because no one was buying any liquor anymore? That kind of thing happened. That happened. Why? Because God's people got right. God used them. It began with a fire. What, what, just one man said, I'm going to be used of God. He wasn't highly educated. Many say he was not even well-spoken. But God used him in a great way. Where do you stand? Will you begin to pray in the same way? Will you begin to pray with God's people here at this church? Will you begin to pray uh, with your family in your home and plead and ask God for revival? Sometimes, and I'll tell you what, in my own heart, that if I ask the Lord for revival, right? I think, here I am with my family, with my children. I ask the Lord for revival. What if it's a big flop? What if we stand up the tent and nobody comes, right? You know what that's called? Lack of faith. I think it's the right thing to do for you to pray for revival and for you to expect revival, uh, whether God gives it or not. It's the right thing for you to do no matter what the response is. You know, God didn't say, I was talking with Brother Sam about this, God did not say to Isaiah and Jeremiah that, hey, listen, you preach and everyone's going to respond, and that's how you know you're doing the right thing. God actually told them, you pray. You preach, you do what's right, and I'm just going to go ahead and warn you, it might not be responded to very well. Look, does that mean, you know, that, you know what that really reveals in my own heart and others? You know what that really reveals? That reveals we want the results more than we just want to be right with God. Uh, we should be in revival no matter what the response is, no matter if the attendance comes in, no matter, no matter if there is a good response. We should have a personal revival. Why? Because it's just the right thing to do. The obstacles to it, of you saying, well, well, I'll be good, and I'll, I'll be holy, and I'll get the sin out of my life. I'll do what's right. If God will respond, that's superstition. 
You do right because it's right. You do right because you love the Lord. You pray and you plead and you serve and you live for God no matter what the response is. And some of us, you know, we've been disappointed by the response of our children. We've been disappointed by the response of, of our co-workers. We've been disappointed by the response of, you know, it doesn't matter. You do what's right no matter what the response is. That's the attitude of revival. We're seeking God not for what he'll give. We're seeking God because of who he is. There are certain results of revival. I want to go back and read Psalm 85. God says, look, these are things that money cannot buy. These are things that man cannot produce. Look with me. Verse number 7. Show us thy mercy, Lord. Grant us thy salvation. Surely his salvation is nine, says verse 9. Glory may dwell in the land. Truth shall spring out of the earth. I love what he says in verse number 10. Truth, mercy and truth are met together. Righteousness and peace have kissed each other. Look, we long for these things. We would, we would, we would, we say we would do whatever it takes, right? God tells us what it takes. It's us having a heart in this season. Say, God, I, I desire a season of revival in my own heart. We're going to conclude this service. We're going to conclude this service with a time of prayer. And you know what I'd like to ask? I'd like to ask Christian, would you ask the Lord to revive your heart? Would you do that? That's the invitation. Would you ask the Lord uh, to give you a renewed passion? If you're here today and you don't know the Lord as your Savior, let me encourage you. You can't take the first step. You can't take the first step. Forget that revival. Uh, you need to come in a relationship with the Lord. Why? Because He is good and He is gracious. And all of us can attest that whether our heart is cold or hot for the Lord, He's still good. God doesn't just strike us with nothing about the mercy of God. And just strike us down when we wander from Him. He draws us back with love, with chastisement, with a proper discipline. He draws us back to Him. We have a good, good God. He paid for our sin on the cross. He rose again to prove it. And he'll save you if you desire for him to. Don't live, Christian, don't live a lukewarm life. God says, I'd rather you be hot. I'd rather you actually be cold. Right in the middle, that lukewarm. God says, you make me sick. I'm going to vomit. I heard a pastor preach a message one time about Christians that make God sick. Christians that make God say, I don't want to be that one. I want to be someone that pleases the Lord. Would you ask the Lord for that today? Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this time. We thank you for your word, Lord. We thank you for the psalmist who wrote and asked, Lord, for you to send revival. Dear Lord, I pray that all of us it will be on the prayer of our hearts that you would send a season of revival, Lord, that you would revive us again. Not for the show, not for the result of it, Lord, but for your own glory. Lord, to bring us close to you in prayer. Lord, you promise that those that seek you in the prayer closet, Lord, you'll reward openly. Lord, we seek you. When we're by ourselves. Lord, we, I pray we seek you when we're alone. I pray we rejoice in you and in your presence. Lord, no matter what the results, no matter what the response may be, dear God, I pray you'd help us to be revived here.